I'm Scott Allen Miller. It is the 6th of August, 2023. This is my vlog of daily life and living in Leon, Nicaragua. Today I am out for a walk. I'm getting a little bit of exercise and I'm going to be addressing the question that has come up a number of times, but let's face it, I need topics for the blog, so I'm gonna handle it again, is how do you go about hiring and what should you expect to pay if you're gonna be hiring household help when you move to Nicaragua? We're gonna answer some of those questions right after the bump. First thing I'm going to be answering today is actually a separate question. I had someone ask me recently, Scott, you do a lot of walking, you go all over the place, but you'll notice I don't really do like mountain hiking kind of stuff. I do mostly fields and, and the road and pretty simple stuff. So nothing nothing too complex. A lot of city walking, uh, but they were interested, what kind of shoes do I use? What kind of footwear am I using? Because, you know, I'm a big guy and I do really long distances. I put a lot of wear and tear on my feet. And of course, uh, last year I broke my right foot. So. Uh, there's quite a need to keep my feet in good condition. So what do I use? And I think everyone's a little bit surprised that the answer is simply, I use Teva sandals about 80% of the time. And then the 20% of the time that I'm doing the hardest walking or I'm in a condition where I can't have closed shoes or whatever, then I'm using some regular everyday sketchers with memory foam insoles. And I use with the sneakers, I have uh, uh, Dr. Scholl's extra insoles for a little bit more support you know, with the Tevas. They're just Tevas and I wear through them incredibly fast, which poses a lot of problems in other ways. So I'm constantly needing to refresh uh, sandals, especially and sneakers. So I go through about two pair to three pair per year, simply because I wear them out so quickly, as you can imagine I would, uh, especially if I tend to like step off a sidewalk or something, I have really strong ankles. That's of course the kind of thing you say just before I slip and fall and break my ankle. But in general, I have quite strong ankles. So traditionally, I have the problem that if I step off the sidewalk or something and the conditions under which many people would twist their ankles, I actually do okay. But what ends up happening is I tear the sandal off of my foot. So I've ripped a number of sandals uh, completely apart and destroyed them but my ankles hold out okay. I fall, I get hurt, but you know, <laughs> mostly okay. And I can't complain, uh, but I do go through sandals relatively quickly. So that is what I use for walking when I come out on days like this. I'm in sandals right now and uh, you know, they work. They work really great in fact. Now it's really warm. So it's one of the reasons that uh, I think sandals work really well in Nicaragua is is a bunch of things one is we have very few things on the ground we have to worry about which may sound crazy like isn't this the land of scorpions okay yeah but like how many have i encountered in all the years i've been here three like it's not like an everyday thing it's just yeah we technically have them and do we have tarantulas well yeah but they don't scurry around your feet or anything like that do we have snakes not not particularly i've seen like a total of i don't know two snakes in the last three years these are not major things you get all the time. The biggest thing you have to worry about when you're walking is ants, and they're not like army ants or fire ants in Texas. It's just normal ants. So once in a while you're gonna get bit, but it's not a big deal. So here, protecting your feet is not really so much of a big deal. You gotta protect the soles because you might get broken glass or whatever, but you don't need to protect the tops of your feet under very many circumstances, but it is really warm. So having something that's light on your foot uh, so it's easier to walk and something that is um, airy so you can cool down is far more important than uh, protection, physical protection. Uh, so it actually makes a lot of sense. We also have an awful lot of beaches. So because of that, often you want sandals because you may end up in a beachy or sandy scenario. Uh, it's just more flexible. And because it's warm all day long, people wear sandals to anything and they tend to be a little bit classier than like sneakers. So it makes it for um, a little bit better experience. Like if I'm gonna walk somewhere and then go out, I feel like I'm dressed for going out. Whereas if I put my sneakers on and then I go out, it's a little bit, you know, underdressed, even though they're really good for long walks. Now, if I'm doing something like walking to the beach and I'm gonna be gone for hours, I'm gonna put on the Skechers. I'm gonna have that extra little bit of ankle support. I mean, I guess it's a bit of ankle support. I'm gonna have that lot of additional sole uh, and then the socks and the insoles, it all adds up. And even though my feet will get warmer and I'll have to lift more weight over mile after mile, that that ends up working out. It really helps uh, uh, ward off the fatigue. 
but for my normal walks for anything like today, I'm just in sandals. So yeah, I don't worry about anything too much. But again, I have strong ankles. So even when I used to mountain climb when I was young, always just in sneakers, I never used boots. I never use ankle support. I've never needed it and I've never had an ankle problem except for one time when I did break my ankle that was in a stampede there was no it didn't matter what I was wearing on my foot it was breaking so that doesn't really matter but as far as actually out walking and stuff just sandals for me I found a quiet little trail and decided to kind of get off the highway and get a little bit of shade and it's a beautiful little spot and I think it makes for some great filming and it gives me really good light and, it, and it's a good spot for me and what's funny is it feels very out of the way. Uh, but as I come up the trail, it's really obvious that this one, it's really well beaten down. So this is used all the time. It feels like I stepped off the road into the middle of nowhere, but I'm pretty sure people are going to walk by every few minutes. This is one of those interesting things in Nicaragua that quite often you end up in a spot that you're convinced you're absolutely isolated. No one is around. And then you realize there really are people nearby almost all the time. Nicaragua has a very strange sense. For, for those of us from North America, growing up in New York, living a long time in Texas, my feelings for what is normal as far as how far people live from each other, how often you run into someone in the woods, things like that are very different than you would experience in Nicaragua. In the United States, we tend to find pretty good distances between houses uh, with a very few people being outside. Here in Nicaragua, we tend to get areas that feel completely wild, but there's actually homes hidden all over the place and people are always outside. So even when you come to a pretty remote area, there's a really good chance that you're gonna find a person somewhere within earshot, just around the corner. Maybe there's a house over the ridge or someone right behind you or people come and go down these trails all the time because the entire population is not locked up in cars driving down the highway. They're actually out walking around around on little paths like I have here. And so this feels, if I was in the same spot in New York, this trail would be, wow, this is something that some kids use during the summer. And it, you know, maybe a farm uses it and someone comes down this trail once a week or once or twice a summer, very little. And here in Nicaragua, this exact same feeling trail, this thing that I'm looking at would be maybe 50 to 100 people would use it per day. It's just a continuous thing always used. It's such a different world. So I feel so isolated out here. And yet I know there's going to be people. And I came out here and of course it's so beautiful. It's such a great spot, but this is one of those Instagram versus reality things. So this is the real, this is the, this is the Instagram, right? I'm kind of controlling the shot a little bit. And then here's the reality. It's, I'm, this is right next to me, right? I'm going to show right here, inches away from me. It's a big burning trash pile. Right? And I'm pretty sure that's my trash from the house that I pay to have taken away. We know that they're going to take it somewhere and burn it because what else are they going to do with it? And it's taken away by a horse and cart. It's not going very far. We know that a lot of trash comes up here. You can see it coming and going from the road, but that there's a big pile just here burning and it's burning right now while I'm here is like, oh yeah, okay. So just a little bit of life in Nicaragua. Okay, so the real question for today that people were asking is, how do you find, how do you hire, and how much should you expect to pay for household help? Now, we've talked about this before, but maybe not in the same context or in the same way, or maybe it needs to be updated. So let's talk about it again. So when you're hiring here in Nicaragua, there's one of the most difficult pieces is finding those people. And that's something we've talked about maybe in the future, providing a service for that. And I don't want anyone to think this is a sales pitch because we're not providing that today. And don't be like, well, in a week, we're going to call you and see if you know. I'm not, it, maybe in six months, maybe in a year, we will have talked about it and may have an idea about it. That's that's kind of what we're we're thinking. So for anyone who's really looking to do it, we're, we're not here to help you. By the time anyone's ready to do that, I'll have, have to have made new videos about it because things will have changed. But it is a problem and there are companies like us who are like, maybe this is something we should approach, but it's very difficult for everybody and it would be difficult and it would be very hard for us to do it outside of places that we operate already. Like here in Leon, in theory, we could do it, but if you're gonna be in Granada, what are we gonna do? We have no idea, right? It's staffing and managing and all that very, very hard. And of course, if you had a company like us do it, um, it could provide a lot of assurance, but it also would add quite a bit of cost to an otherwise very cheap process. Not an insurmountable amount of cost, but a pretty significant percentage because the people who will oversee those people are quite expensive. And that may be something you wanna build in and I'll talk about how my house operates. I've mentioned it from time to time, but in a context like this, it's important to put it all together and to understand what that structure is like. So 
pretty typically when you're looking at household help, that's a maid, that's a cook, that's someone to do your laundry, people doing just tasks around the house, a gardener, most of those positions are going to start around $200 per month. Now keep in mind, month here is lunar, so it's 13 times a year, not 12 times a year. Just remember that. So when you're looking at annual numbers, which is probably how Americans will want to think about it, it's about $2,600 a year, not $2,400. That's your minimum. Can you go below that? Maybe, but only if it's part-time staff or if you're providing a lot of other benefits. If they're going to be living in and getting room and board, you're providing all their food, you're providing their internet, you're providing absolutely everything and all they have to do is work and make some money, then yes, there may be a way to go a little bit below 200, but you're not going to go much below 200, maybe like 190, right? So yeah, maybe you can negotiate that down a tiny bit, but be aware you may be negotiating below minimum wage and what you give them in benefits probably won't count against you uh, or count towards you, I guess, should there be a dispute. If you ended up in court, you would want to be able to show that you had been paying minimum wage. So I recommend simply sucking it up and paying whatever the minimum wage is, even if you're in a situation where they would be willing to go lower because you're providing so many resources. Now, if you're gonna do part-time, talk to a lawyer and see what you can do. But if you're gonna have a full-time person live in or not, assume you're gonna hit that minimum wage. And that's not a big number, so just pay it, right? Like, that's at some point, you don't wanna be trying to get a good deal. You're talking about someone's entire earning potential here. So uh, what's often done is people who are at or, or around that minimum wage number are probably getting those extra benefits, internet, room and board, something, right? Something that makes it quite a bit better. And you probably want something better so that you're not getting the people who are moving from job to job and you want the people who are taking a little bit more professionally who are looking for a long-term thing. Now, if you're only here for six months, you're like, look, I just need someone for six months. All I need is someone I can trust. I don't need them to be good. I don't need them to be fast and I don't want them to stay. It's, I just got six months, but I want some help. Well, then a $200 person might be fine. You're going to need to um, do like we do, right? We go through an attorney or someone else that's local, knows a number of people, can oversee them and will to some degree vouch for them. We had just the other day. Now, we've lived here for a little while. But, and I'm here with our burning trash, our trash uh, collector, the guy who does our trash, he, uh, who's not staff, right? He sent someone to our house who's looking to be a maid. Now we have a maid, so we didn't need someone, but they're currently looking for a job and used him as a reference. They were very much like, here's my number. Here's what I do. Here's what I'm willing to do. I live right here. Here's my reference. I'd love a job, right? And they were going door to door, letting people know that they were they were looking for work. And that may be a pretty decent option once you've been here for a little while. The thing that's challenging is when you first arrive, finding a person on arrival is difficult because you have none of those connections and you don't know who to talk to. If you're here in Leon, of course, we can make some introductions and at least get you a starting point. But if you're in Matagalpa or you're in Rivas, I've got nothing to help you with. So you're going to need to find a local resource, maybe your lawyer, maybe a neighbor. Um, you'll probably when you move through the process of moving, get to know one or two people, and hopefully someone can at least help you look for that first person to help you. If you're like us, we ended up going through a number of people. Uh, we were a little bit more flexible because we hired someone, they didn't work out. We replaced them with someone who worked for us somewhere else. They weren't really good at the things we needed here. They're really good at things other places. So we just moved them back to where they were previously. Uh, so it wasn't like we got rid of them. We simply shuffled them around within the grand scope of our, our employment. We then uh, brought on someone else who didn't work out. We ended up with a fourth, fourth and fifth and sixth person that are all there now, right? We have multiple people. Um, and it just took a little while. Uh, and at some point, we decided to pay a little bit extra, have more benefits, and bring someone that we knew from one of our other jobs. And that's how we ended up with most of our people. So paying, you're going to pay somewhere between about 200 and 250. On the very, very highest end, you'll probably be paying about 300. Now, that's not, this, that's not true in all cases. You want a good handyman, you may be paying more than 300. You want a major domo that's going to really oversee things, manage people, do a bunch of extra stuff, handle a lot of complex things, easily 400 or $500. Now, what is our structure? We have, at this point, two major domos, but that's just a temporary thing. We have two people who oversee all aspects of the house, and they both do so remotely, and, and they both have some other jobs. So it 
Kind of strange how we have it structured, but it's only temporary. Long term, we have a major domo who's here on the show from time to time, and she oversees the entire household. She makes sure that people show up to work on time. She know, makes sure that they know what their duties are for the day. She'll take care of overseeing uh, receipts if they go shopping, because we send people shopping for us. That's an important part of their jobs, because we don't have time to go shopping, and they can go to markets and get better prices than we can. They know how to find things that, that we can't find. They can spend time shopping without it impacting our workday, whatever. So that's a really important um, aspect of what they do. So our major domo is much more expensive, uh, and, and she oversees, but she she works basically all the time. Um, so if we need something in the middle of the night, she's responsive to that. We need something on a weekend, she's responsive to that. You need, so kind of, she's she kind of gets a flexible schedule, but she kind of works seven days a week as well. She's multiple times the minimum wage rate, right? So it's a completely different uh, numerical thing. And you probably don't need that person unless you're running a company like us and, and we have lots of people that are being overseen by the staff. We're kind of a unique scenario. But the idea that you may have a major domo, the idea that you may have a butler or a house manager who's gonna oversee everything that goes on in your house and then have multiple staff that work for you is realistic. For some of you, it's a stretch. Oh, 200. Can I afford 200 a month? That's a lot out of my budget. Legit. But for others, spending 1000 or 1500 a month to have a staff of people who take care of absolutely everything is a no-brainer. So you may fall anywhere in that spectrum or even to the I can't afford anything or 1500 Why not spend 15000 Whatever. But I think the, the bulk of people are going to fall below 1500 a month, but at 200 or more. Okay. I thought that a person was going to come through, but I was wrong. It's a cow. The first thing to interrupt me is a cow coming into the trash pile. For a lot of people, when you only have, you know, one person or a couple, having a single person who does a lot of tasks around the house can be extremely beneficial and not very expensive, and you can easily oversee them yourself. If you go for a generous, generalist, someone who can clean, someone who can cook, and someone who can take care of minor things like answering the door when someone comes to drop off a receipt or pick up a package, maybe going to the store and do grocery shopping for you, whether you're a retiree and you don't want to have to deal with traveling around town, or you're working from home and you don't want to worry about being interrupted for little things during the day, this can work out absolutely perfectly. And you just simply prioritize, take care of my interruptions, make sure I'm handled during the day as the first things, then make me a sandwich when they're time and clean in between things when there's nothing else to do. That can work really well and you'll know if they're idle or need something to do or how you can best leverage them and that's a great way to start and a lot of people do that, especially if you have a smaller house where the cleaning is not overwhelming. We always have a lot of people and so our houses are always quite large and just cleaning the house can be a challenge. There's so much to do that it can take an entire day just to get halfway through the house so it's every two days they make it through everything and have to start over. So it depends on a lot of things, but even if you just have a small apartment, it's not too bad. It is super humid out here today. I'm sweating terribly, even though it's not really that hot, but it's really humid and there's not a lot of wind. For us, we need a lot of people. We have a very large garden, which you see on the show quite often. We do not staff that directly, but we do have a team of gardeners. There are about five people, and they work one day a week for an entire day. So it's the equivalent of a full-time person, but we hire out a service for that. So that costs the same. It is $200 a month, very roughly. It's slightly more. It's $50 per week, so it's a little bit more than four weeks in a month, so whatever that is, $425, $450 a month. That's what we pay for that, but it gives us an entire team and they come with equipment, and that's a big deal. Uh, they also have a manager that oversees them. He collects the money. It makes it very, very simple. Uh, but our major domo and our other staff oversee them. If the gardeners need anything, they can be let in. They, that's one of the big things for us. We don't have to be around to let people in the door. So if, if someone shows up and, and like they come to collect the trash early in the morning, our major domo or our chef or our maid may go and open the, the gate and let them in, oversee them getting the trash, pay them, whatever. Those little things are a big deal. It's amazing how often there are tiny payments that need to happen throughout the day. And if you have to do that yourself, you're going to be interrupted all the time. And you're going to find that very frustrating in many cases. But it's not a lot of money. We're talking about $2 here, $5 there. It's, it's pretty small. You budget for that and, and you'll be like, oh, we're talking $50 a month. We can, we can handle this, right? But those ancillary fees can be really annoying if you're doing them all yourself. Uh, someone stopped by and rang the bell to tell me about the electric bill. Someone stopped by and rang the bell to tell 
tell me about the water bill. Someone stopped by and rang the bell. Like, are you kidding me? There's so many people coming to the door. That little stuff, those little interruptions, they make a huge difference and impact your ability to work, to relax, whatever. Now, some people don't mind it because they're not doing too much, but for those of us who are working and it's like interrupting calls and unable to work on projects, that stuff can be really big. So just having someone who can do that, which could be anybody, right? It could be a major domo, it could be just your maid, but that, that role can be very important. For us, we then have, I, I now have a pack of dogs that came instead of the, the cows. So it's getting kind of interesting. They're like fighting behind me. They're in the trash pile. I think they're just playing because they're like puppies. So, uh, so we have a maid who cleans the house and we have a, a chef who cooks. Those are the most important roles because we need so many meals per day. And otherwise we go out to eat or spend all of our time cooking. And our house is very large. It needs to be cleaned all the time. And that includes, you know, she'll put, up, put on the sprinklers and water the lawn. She'll water the, the garden plants and stuff like that. So it's more than just cleaning, but there's a lot that needs to be done. So that's an everyday thing. And of course we have, you know, f nine bedrooms and like seven bathrooms and there's outdoor spaces and the gardeners can only do so much. So she's involved in that. And there's, we have outdoor patio spaces that are quite large and multiple of them and just patrolling the house and stuff and looking for little things that that all adds up so we keep those people busy and then you know our house is over 50 years old and we have upgrades we want to do i have a new studio wall going in that i mentioned the other day hopefully uh, like tomorrow it's going to be in place i said that yesterday but i'm recording this video on the same day so it didn't go up yet and um <clears throat> like so we have a handyman who's constantly working on our wiring constantly working on our air conditioning constantly working on uh he'll do the, the technical cleaning like cleaning out the air conditioners uh doing new lights and and fixing there's just little things that need to be fixed all the time, right? With, with so many people and so many things in an older house, it's nonstop. So those three positions are just n completely busy every day. And the majordomo oversees all of them and helps them know what's going on, uh, approves the budget, gives them money so they can go buy things because all of them are going, well, the maid is not, but the chef is going shopping once or twice a week. The handyman's going shopping three or four or even five times a week. He also doubles as a chauffeur. So if I'm not available, he was taking people places. Now, of course, Paul's here, so he mostly does the chauffeuring. But if both of us are busy, our handyman will go out and do that as well. And he'll take uh, other people. What is are these? He will go and take things like the chef or the maid and take them, say, to the supermarket so they can go shopping and then drive them back to save time. So there's a lot of flexibility with that. Not a lot of people know how to drive here or have a license. So it's important if you do have someone that could be very beneficial for them to help out with that if you have a vehicle. Uh, so those, and then all of them oversee the gardeners and um, occasionally other staff. For example, today, as I'm recording this, we have our air conditioning staff in the house uh, because we had an air conditioner that actually had a metal failure, like actual metal parts part failed just metallurgically uh, and they had to go find a replacement part took them all day and then weld in the new part like major major work but that had to be done because the kids needed their air conditioning it was for luciana's room large staff but almost all of them are in the same ballpark it's going to be about 200 for most of the staff the handyman may be more like 300 and then if you're going to have a manager figure at least 400 if not 500 now that is assuming no one speaks English, or if they do really poorly. In our case, no one speaks English, not even our major domo, nobody. It's 100% Spanish, and we just put up with that. But that also helps keep the cost down. If you're going to have someone who speaks English really well, assume you're looking at at least $700. Now, most of our staff do not live with us. Only our chef does. And once in a while, the maid will stay with us and uh, because we do have the space. And the major domos will often stay in the house. Um, so we can have multiple people stay there. Really, we could have the entire staff stay there if we needed to. If there's like a terrible storm or something, they would fit. Oh, one of the dogs is poking through. He's right high. Oh, we're gonna turn the camera and show him. Here he is. Yeah, you came to see. He's like, what are you doing here? Why are she? Why are you here? She says. This is my people don't hang out here making videos. This is this is messed up, she says. So uh, so we, so for our chef, for example, uh, we're able to pay a little bit less, but she, all of our staff eats in the house and they have a chef that cooks for them. So she's able to cook for herself and cooks for everyone else. That adds a big benefit and keeps the, the payroll cost down, but we have to buy more food for that. And some of her time is, is tied up in preparing food for them. So that kind of stuff goes on, but you have to kind of play with the numbers and see what makes sense for you. For most of you, one to two people is going to be all you need. And I should mention, we also have a security guard that we share with a few other houses and that he's full time. So he's not dedicated to us and we certainly don't have to pay as much as we do for our full time people, but it's a major component as well. So we have this very large staff nearly all the time. Um, and for us, it's incredibly beneficial because we're all working from home. We have two students and three professional working adults, plus the major domos do other things and have other roles. So they need that support staff as well in some cases. And so it all makes sense for 
for us. For you, chances are, for the majority of you, nearly all of you, having one and maybe two people who do things for you uh, with, with blended roles and, and willing to be a little bit flexible will work best. And if you can find people who can, and if you have property where they can live with you, you're going to get a much better scenario, both in that you won't have to pay above the lowest rates, probably, and you'll you know you'll be able to get a better deal on food. They'll you know there's just it, it's a, there's a, a scalability that that works out really well. So that generally works out quite well. There's almost always someone who'd be really excited to get room and board and make enough money and not have to worry about paying those bills. Right, all they have to do is use their money on clothes or whatever, and then um, in many cases like ours, right, we have TVs in the house, we have internet access. Of course they can use those things. There's things in the living room. There's times that we're not there and they have the run of the house. Like that stuff um, is, is relatively beneficial because if they were at home, often they don't have a TV. Often they don't have internet. Maybe they have it on their phone, just, you know, the basic service and they've got WhatsApp. But the, to be able to watch movies like Netflix and stuff may be something they don't have access to. So these can be nice benefits that make it well worthwhile for them. Uh, to take a job that may pay a little bit less, but it's so flexible that uh, it makes it well worth it for everybody. So there's ways to win. Be flexible, but don't try to go below that minimum wage number. That's not going to work out well for you. And uh, that kind of gives you a budget and kind of gives you an idea of how it works and how it works for us. And as far as hiring, you just need to find local resources for now. Someday, hopefully, we'll have a service, but I don't even know what that would look like. I have no idea how we would do that yet. It's not something we're putting energy into because we have so many projects going on. That's not a high priority, but it is an idea that we have kicked around. Thanks for joining me. Get down into those comments. Let me know what you think. Ask more questions. Say hi. Talk to each other. Get involved. Find out what's going on. Just chat. If you're on a TV, you got to go do that from a computer. You can't do it on a TV. But if you are on a TV or on a computer, wherever you are, take a moment, hit that up button, whatever, and go give a thumbs up to the show. That stuff matters. If you have a moment, go watch another episode or just put it on in the background. You don't have to actually pay attention to it. Better if you do. Not a big deal. Just go make more coffee and let it run because that stuff really helps tell YouTube how much you appreciate the show. And you can also tell me how much you appreciate the show by buying me a coffee at the link above buymeacoffee.com slash Scott L. Miller. If you'd like to reach out to us about any assistance with relocating, whether it's actual physical assistance or just a conversation, info at relocatenicaragua.com. As always, share on social media, post this link wherever you can, tell your friends, tell your family, and I will see all of you tomorrow.